Thank you, everybody, for joining in today. I'm Doug Brunke, founder and CEO of Global Chamber. And so we um, have a, a conversation today that was inspired by Anita Rodal, but it's really inspired by our members, and it's around uh, exporting and importing. Hopefully, um, and uh, Cesar, thank you for joining. Could you give me access as well to the to control muting and all? So for those of you who are joining for the time being, if you could mute yourself and we'll you know proactively do that as well so that we have a great conversation. We have one of our speakers today is recorded. And then we, I think have three speakers uh, who are live and in person the purpose of this is to give you tips and techniques and hopefully connections and ideas to be able to be more successful with your trading uh, experiences, both importing and exporting. And we are even thinking about having an investment aspect as well in future programs. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Anita Rodal, who is the best at several things that you'll ever meet. She's definitely the best at getting your networking pitch down perfectly. She's also a currency expert. So if you're doing foreign currency activity, you should definitely talk to Anita. She's got a variety of different solutions and experience in that space that can really help you. She's part of our Global Chamber Los Angeles Advisory Board. And she's just a really great resource to have and somebody you should have on your speed dial. And so Anita, thank you for leading this conversation today. I turn it over to you. So much, Doug, and thank you for the accolades. And now I don't have to do my 30 second elevator pitch, so that's perfect. <laughs> um, but thank you, everybody, for joining our very first conversation about importing and exporting. So, um, Doug already covered the mute stuff, that's fantastic. Uh, let me ask those of you that don't have your complete names on your little squares if you would rename yourself, rename yourselves with your full. Um, first and last name, because it makes it a lot easier for people to find you. And don't forget to put all your contact information, including a link to your LinkedIn in the chat. And then hopefully everybody will save the chat and they'll be able to reach out to you afterwards. Um, so for today's webinar, um, like Doug said, we have four guest speakers. One's an importer, one's an exporter. Then we have an import specialist and an export specialist and everyone's backgrounds and focuses are different. The idea is that we, with each of these Globinars, and we will be going monthly beginning in January of 2024, the idea is that we all learn a little bit more about different aspects of importing and exporting from a variety of perspectives and even from a variety of different countries. So um, I will read a real abbreviated bio about each speaker before we jump into their individual um, interview. So first up is Lynn James Meyer. So let me tell you about um, Lynn, just it's mind blowing what she's done. And this is just the short version, right? Lynn James Meyer is the co-founder and CEO of Biosafe Technologies Incorporated, which she established in 2000. Biosafe Technologies mission is to develop safe and effective insecticide and medicinal alternatives worldwide. Since 2003, Lynn has been manufacturing and exporting a specialized non-toxic head lice shampoo, in addition to other non-toxic pesticide products for humans and animals. She has been heavily involved in the research as well as coordinating the groundbreaking formulations for which she now owns an astounding 23 patents and trademarks. Lynn's numerous accolades include Global Exporter of the Year and multiple Stevie Awards in 2017, including the Lifetime Achievement, the Maverick of the Year, and the Entrepreneur of the Year. And the Stevie Awards, by the way, are the world's premier business awards. I looked it up. Okay, so let's get started. Lynn, you ready? I think so. <laughs> okay, so first question for you. You established Biosafe Technologies in 2000. When did you export your first product and what was it? It was in 2003 and it was a non-toxic head lice shampoo for children. Okay. Can you speak, like get a little bit closer to your yes. microphone possibly? Sure. Or speak Sorry. louder. Yes. That's okay. Yes. Okay. So you said you, so it was in 2003 and what was the product? Uh, a non-toxic head lice shampoo, which uh, was going into children's lines 
uh, under branded wines in Europe. My sister could have used that when my nieces were in elementary school. <laughs> Um, and what part of your business these days is exporting versus domestic sales? Well, exporting has always been at least 90% of our business. Um, we do domestic, um, and we've been on Amazon for about 12 or 13 years, but and we are in some stores, but basically it's been exporting, and for good reason. I guess we'll go into so it. So tell me why. What was that decision? Making process. Well, it was very hard in, to establish a market in the U.S., much different than in Europe at the time that we were attempting to do so. And it, that was based really on more the regulatory hurdles um, and the type of marketing. Um, but there are there's reasons why we got started there, too. We were doing research in the U.K., so it kind of brought us to that territory early on. Okay. Okay, fantastic. Now, when you export, do you export exclusively to distributors in another country, or do you sell to foreign retailers as well? It's interesting. They're distributors, two different types, really. One uh, is a large pharma that took the product into their children's line, and then they have subcontractors, subdistributors, and they export outside of France and different areas of Europe and outside Europe where the other is also a distributor, but they put it, our product into their brand and they only sell within their own stores. So, and they're well-known, it's a well-known brand. Um, so it's two types of distributors, I guess you could say. Okay, that's awesome. So what countries, I know you mentioned France, but um, mm -hmm. what countries do you currently export to? The UK and France. Okay, awesome. And, um, so if you have that distribution system built up, do you still get people reaching out to you that want to uh, import your product in their country? Um, or do you still actively look for other people to import in other countries? Well, we do have uh, people coming uh, occasionally. Um, and really our, our biggest uh, entry into the market were companies going to the research specialist we were working with in the UK, they were seeking just someone or products. And that uh, that's what where our introductions came in. So you can almost say they were looking for us, but not looking for us. They, they were looking for the product and, and got it that way. And there are others that um, it, it's difficult to uh, go it, to get our products into other countries without having a set distributor there that can go through the regulatory hurdles and market without us having to package and do our own brands. It's a, it's a little complicated, but that was our entry really. It was really distributors or companies looking for our product. Okay. So what criteria would you use to determine if you were going to work with an additional distributor in, a, in another country? Like, what do they need to bring to the table for you? Well, they, the, the ideal is our model, supplying in bulk, ready-made formula. The best is if they have a line, an existing line, and they want to put ours into their line. They also have to meet a criteria um, where there is a screening by the Exim Bank for the, they do the credit checks and because they do back us and and uh, and of course uh, our receivables are insured there. So we have to kind of meet their criteria. Um, and whether the country actually honors and respects IP. So those are those are all points that we watch for when someone does want to take on our, our product. Or our yeah, or license yeah. even yeah oh no that makes perfect sense um, are you like how many different countries um, have you are you protected in well we have international patents um, it doesn't cover every country in the world it it covers the major ones that we would know would respect the IP and um, we also arrange um, contracts territorial, um, and some of them, even in the contract, if they go to a country um, where our patent isn't, uh, they have to honor it as if it was. So, you know, it's, it's 
it's contractual with our distributor and it's also something we're key about ourselves uh, as far as that okay. goes. Okay. Now, did you ever turn somebody down as a potential importer and why? Like what was the red flag? Um, well, the red flag was they weren't um, big enough really to order the kind of quantities that would even make it a, a, a valid product for them. Our, our product has very good ingredients and it's a little uh, more expensive than the average. Um, and meeting price points were, were not possible in some respects. And also finding an agent that could represent us with the regulatory work that would need to be uh, put ahead. Um, if they couldn't do it uh, without having our own presence in a country, our company in a certain country, we have to find an agent that's reliable and that we can trust handling uh, those particular issues. So uh, yeah, it's that's really basically what the problem has been. Um, we really need to, to supply not packaged finished product, but something where someone can take it and bottle it and finish the uh, packaging on their side. It's not under always bottle, something they want name to or do. under yours? I'm sorry. Uh, no, it they usually, it's best if they put it in their own brand. If it's in our brand, there's a lot more responsibility we have after the fact, we'd rather kind of have a clean sale, make it, sell it, and let them take it, do all the marketing strategies and and uh, and protect their own brand. Um, so as long as uh, that's been a very good way of operation for us for a long time. Good. It sounds sounds amazing. Yeah. So so as an exporter, what gets you most excited about what you do, like from the exporting perspective? Well, I think, you know, especially if you develop something yourself and it brings value to a lot of people, you know, it's a problem that can solve, you have something that can solve an international problem as well as local. It's nice to see it's being used and and the, it, it definitely um, seeing the smiles on children's faces or getting responses from from staff, from schools, even internationally, where the, you know, when they have something that really does work and it's also cosmetically elegant at the same time. So it makes people smile. <laughs> it, it's nice to know when you do something that it has a benefit. So. Absolutely. And when I used to yeah. live in South America, I wish oh. your products had been in existence back then. That's another story. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> what, um, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I'm waiting for the question. Okay. So looking back, is there anything that you would have done differently in your trajectory as an exporter? Yeah, I think that I would have um, not tried to do everything possible under the sun myself in the early days. Uh, I, the The time of the, the market was really, really ripe for our product um, was in the mid 90s. And there were so many things that could have been done faster. And I think if I had um, taken in some investment capital to push it a little quicker and, and get people that were a little more seasoned in a field that I was not, I had to learn a lot the hard way. Um, we could have gotten out there faster. I think that was one, um, one thing I would have changed. But otherwise, I, I think the course we followed was a good one. Okay, awesome. Well, Thank clearly you. it was very effective. So pivoting onto you specifically, how can we global chamber members help you grow your business? Like what kind of referrals would you like? Well, I think it's when I'm, when there are countries looking for where we're looking or seeking more distribution, it's good to know a little bit about the country. So meeting someone in business there to get a flair for how things are, maybe where local uh, regulatory agencies are or how uh, possibly even what the key businesses are that would re relate to ours as kind of contact points, things like that would work. It always brings us back to having to go through the, you know, the hurdles of getting it on through their system of regulatory. So I found when I when I'm introduced to people from other countries where I have an interest that they at least give me a, a start as to where to go, you know, or of course it would always be nice to be introduced into a company or somebody, if somebody had a, a relationship or knew, but 
but that's about the uh, the best, you know, in my in my particular case. Okay, thank you for that. All righty, so perfect timing. Lynn, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your experience with us. We are going to shift over now to Dwight Winkler. And let me tell you a little bit about Dwight before we hey, dive hey. into the questions. So Anita? Dwight Winkler, yes. Just a quick question. What um, what uh, expectations does the audience have to ask questions? Is it going to be at the end? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We'll be doing yeah. that at the end after everybody's, after I've done all the interviews. Okay, got it. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. All righty. So where was I? <laughs> Dwight Winkler, founder of DW Global Trade Solutions, is a cross-border trade consultant and an accomplished, experienced global executive who has spent 36 years of his career living in West Africa, Southeast Asia, and the Middle East. He has a proven track record with Fortune 100 U.S. multinational companies and has grown U.S. export sales revenue in over 70 countries. Dwight advises sales organizations on how to successfully promote trade while minimizing risks. He is also skilled in contact, contract drafting and negotiation. So, Dwight... You ready? Yes, I'm ready. Let's go. All righty. First question. Um, we know you've been doing this for 36 years, but let me ask you this. Actually longer, what but go got on. You... I'm sorry, say that again? Actually a little longer, but go on. <laughs> okay. Well, you can up that number if you want. It just depends on the vanity factor. Um, <laughs> what got you into the field? I When I finished my master's degree at Thunderbird, um, I really, frankly, wasn't sure where I was going to head. And uh, uh, through a course of some networking early on in the first few months, um, I was able to get connected with, at that time, uh, a group called the Foreign Credit Insurance Association, FCIA, which uh, is an insurance uh, entity um, at that time was connected with U.S. Export-Import Bank to cover commercial and political risk. So I started basically as a credit risk underwriter to ensure export receivables. I was in the Chicago office uh, covering the uh, nine states of the upper Midwest. And so I was at, um, uh, focusing on a client base that uh, went from anywhere from hybrid seed products like you would get out of Iowa, Nebraska to uh, heavy duty uh, agricultural machinery, construction equipment machinery to um, uh, small aircraft and we would underwrite the insurance on that, either directly with the exporter involved or with uh, banks that had policies, you know, master yeah. policies, uh, uh -huh. and they would approach us because it was beyond their discretionary limit or um, uh, with banks, other, other brokers. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. All righty. So, Let's see, one of your specialties is helping U.S. manufacturers increase their export sales revenue, utilizing a number of U.S. funded financing sources, such as the Exim Bank. Can you very briefly describe what that entails? Well, I, I guess it, it, it is as a, uh, out, uh, as a uh, outcome of the tenure that I had at uh, doing the insurance underwriting, I eventually became an international credit manager for Harris Corporation in their broadcast product division. That was a global responsibility and then ultimately led to um, uh, my time with Motorola uh, Credit Corp, uh, where I was um, utilizing uh, any manner of sources of financing, whether it was Exim Bank, banks, insurance uh, uh, products, or even Japanese trading company products to help uh, fund export sales. Because if, if you're working for the companies like I did, the name of the game was let's not keep these uh, receivables, whether they're short term or medium term on our books. Let's get it off so we can move on to the next sale and not impact our uh, balance sheet. Keep it off the balance sheet. Only do okay. selective balance sheet financing. Okay. Now, are there private sector foreign financial institutions that will assist U.S. manufacturers in selling into those foreign countries? I think the uh, whether it's a foreign institution or a domestic U.S., I think it, it it's uh, uh, not uh, relevant. If if they have the appetite to do um, a financing and they know that they can uh, 
uh, take on that business uh, and that they're more than willing to go to work and do it. I mean, my experience is that I've been able to work with uh, banks in, in Asia, uh, all, all the continents in that who, who might have an appetite to support a, a sale if it meets their uh, criteria and uh, credit risk uh, appetite. So that's why the job is very much, if you're trying to finance export sales and not do it directly yourself, the name of the game is getting out and getting into the market and that and reaching out to any manner of institution to tap into their readiness to support and then you bring them uh, in. So it's, it's kind of colorblind to, uh, uh, or country, you know, blind to um, uh, where you want to um, source the money as long as you can uh, uh, get it done and, and as I say, mitigate the risk and keep it off your balance sheet. Okay, that's, that's a beautiful thing. Now, I know that you help exporters with contract drafting and negotiation. What, when do things like that typically come into play in the process? Well, part of it's driven by what it is you're selling in that and what is the actual value of it. If you're just selling a, uh, and, and what your credit policy is within your company. I mean, you, what's your threshold of where you're going to want a contract or where a purchase order will suffice? I mean, I can tell you one of the uh, companies that I was with in the Middle East, anything over $60,000 equivalent required a contract. Anything less than that was a simple purchase order. So uh, it, it really depends on what's the, uh, and what's the complexity of the deal? Do you have post delivery requirements like uh, uh, installation or after sales servicing or what your warranty conditions are? And that those can't all be covered in a purchase order, but can only be dealt with in uh, a contract. So it's really has, it's, 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 it's transaction driven. And it goes back to what have you as a company, whether you're a one person company or a medium size or, or large, what is your policy relative to your commercial terms and conditions, your credit uh, approach? And that you have to have that in place so that you can then use that to guide you on how you transact uh, uh, your product wherever it happens to be going with whom and with whomever it is that you're, you're dealing with. Okay. Okay, interesting. Um, so what are a few of the risks that manufacturers should be aware of as they enter the world of global trade? And at what point would you recommend they reach out to an expert such as yourself for help in minimizing the risks? Well, it goes back partially to what I just said and that they have to really establish in their own shop, what is their um, credit policy? What are the commercial terms under which they want to carry out business? And then they need to look at, well, how am I going to work overseas? Am I going to go direct? Meaning I'm going to have my own uh, uh, resources and that we are, are, are selling directly abroad, or am I going to be going through a channel, uh, indirect, in uh, you know, to, through channels and that for distribution. And, and then it becomes what's the due diligence I've done on that entity that I'm working with, whether it's in Europe or in Africa or South America, and that if you're working with a distributor, I mean, that's your gateway to whatever that market is. And it's, you need to make that choice and that decision uh, fairly early, early on. So uh, that's where someone who has the experience with that to be able to do help in that due diligence process and, and, and validate through other third parties, you know, credit reporting agencies, uh, commerce department, um, you know, the embassies, I mean, you can name a, all manner of different ways to get information and, and you need to do the, um, a direct approach. I don't think you could, if, if you're selling a major product overseas, I don't think, at least I wouldn't want to make that decision unless I had actually met with who it was that I was going to be going to work and doing with. So therefore you need to be prepared to make that level of investment. It's not an armchair decision. Okay. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Now, pivoting back to you, how can Global Chamber members help you grow your business? Who would you like to meet in terms of referrals? Well, I'm, I'm kind of uh, irrespective of the company size. Uh, if they do not have in-house expertise to um, uh, deal with navigating these, uh, these issues and working with sales organizations, if they have one, 
to help make sure that they make the right decisions and that and to help structure their deals correctly and that I can come in and do that uh, with them or a small and medium sized enterprise that's thinking about or maybe considering or has done exporting but somewhat opportunistically or incrementally but wants to do more than that to help them shape how they approach that business to bring some of the things that I just said relative to setting up your own uh, credit and commercial policy. I don't care if you're a one person shop or a large company, you have to have that. Otherwise, you, what are you doing? Uh, you, you, need, you need that's that's the groundwork. And once that's set in place, then you know to help them make those decisions and find you know where there are ways to go to work and help mitigate the risk. There's not one size fits all to this. That's kind of what makes the business kind of, for me kind of exciting because it's not a cookie cutter off the shelf approach right. necessarily. Right. Um, Got it. And that's so I'm looking okay. for companies that you know, need to bring in that expertise, but they've got to be willing to make the investment. You know, I'm, I'm not, um, I'll just be blunt. I mean, I'm not available for free. Got it, got it, got it. Of course. Okay. So perfect. Thank you so much for joining the conversation Thank and you so sharing much your indeed. knowledge and expertise with us. Appreciate it. And we're going to move over to Shalom right now. Are you Hi, ready, are Shalom? You? I am Hi. ready. Okay, good. All right, so let me tell you all a little bit about Shalom first. Shalom Bako, also known as the Hibiscus King, is a leading expert on international trade and doing business in Africa. He is the global managing director of Afrivana. His experience and influence spans from the African Sahel region to the United States. He is both a farmer and exporter in Africa, as well as a successful entrepreneur and importer in the United States. Shalom was born and raised in northern Nigeria, but moved to the United States as a teenager. <laughs> and for those of you who are soccer fans, he used to play professionally with the Los Angeles Galaxy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Questions then. Shalom, when did you first begin importing into the United States? Thank you. Um, I would say, you know, I started importing right around 2015, uh, technically. Yeah. Okay, cool. And what was the first product that you imported? Uh, it was actually a pallet of ginger powder, ginger oil, shea butter, and hibiscus. Oh, wow. Okay, nice. And so you... You were exporting from Africa before you were importing into the United States, correct? Yeah, the United States was really the first place I imported to and exported okay. to. Yeah. Okay. So what prompted you to start importing? I, I would say a couple of things. Um, I tried exporting from the U.S. into Africa. Uh, that was really my first venture. And that was in 2010. And I just saw an opportunity to become a distributor of African products. I didn't really find a lot of uh, reliable or major distributors for uh, African products. And that was the reason why. Okay, fantastic. So at this point in time, how many products do you import now? Oh, um, I would say roughly about, we are at about, um, nine products at the moment. Okay. Oops, you you got muted. Shalom, can you unmute yourself? Yes. There you go. Okay, so about yeah. about nine products at the moment. Okay, fantastic. Um, now, how do you determine what products you want to import? Sorry. Oh, um, there you go. So I decide the products really based on research and demand. So we we put, you know, some time into some research as to, um, you know, what's in the market in the States and what's in demand. Um, we use some software to look at, you know, uh, what's available on Amazon, how much they're selling, quantities, price, 
and um, general market research as well. I go to a lot of supermarkets and uh, look at what's on the shelf and what we could potentially import. And then I do further research. Okay. And uh, so research is key. How do you find your customers here in the U.S.? Is it trade shows, social media, direct marketing? Like All these above. Happen? Um, it's been kind of all over the place. People find people find me on social media. Some people reach out. So uh, in the beginning, I would say a lot of cold calling uh, was was the way, and then that transitioned into some trade shows to meet people in person. Just like uh, Dwight said, that in person is really really important. I I I think that's fundamental to this business, at least to me. And then um, social media as well. So a, a little mix of everything currently. Okay. Now, do you do any direct to consumer sales like on Amazon or do you do any retailing yourself or is it all strictly bulk sales and white labeling and private labeling? Yeah, we've actually bulk online sales are actually our biggest uh, category at the moment. So people find us and buy online in bulk. Oh, cool. All righty. Yeah. Now, um, how do your customers typically pay you? Do you give them terms or is it just like as soon as it hits the it, shore? It really depends and varies per customer. Generally, there's always, um, you know, I would say at least 50-50 terms. And it really depends on the delivery schedule and timeline. So if delivery is coming directly from Africa straight to a customer's warehouse, then, you know, we, we get a little flexible on the terms with a down payment and then payment on the delivery. Um, if it's within the, you know, North America or in the United States, it's pretty straightforward. They pay cash and carry type of situation. So um, really depends on the volume of the product and where it's coming from and where it's going to be delivered. Okay. All righty. So looking back, is there anything you would have done different between how you're running things now and what you did when you first started in 2015? Oh yeah. I think a number of things. Um, I remember someone saying earlier, you know, you'd probably get some help a bit earlier in, in the game. Um, I wouldn't say I had a lot of experience or a lot of people to, to go to for advice and, and guidance and mentorship. So um, I would have perhaps sought that out a bit more. Um, I would say that's the biggest, probably the biggest one would probably be that. Okay. All right. That makes yeah. sense. So there's a definitely recurring theme here, like get help early. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We sum things up in three words. Um, okay. So pivoting to you. How can we global chamber members help you grow your business? Who would you like referrals from? Great question. Um, I think re referrals are probably the best form of uh, a request, if you will. You know, um, we do sell, sell some specialty foods. So, you know, any referrals with, um, you know, health food chains or supermarkets would be helpful. Buyers, let's just call it produce and dried fruit and nut buyers would be very helpful. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. All righty. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your knowledge and experience with us. We're going to do questions and answers um, right after the recorded portion, which we're going to go into in just a second from Carlessa. So um, let me share her bio with you all real quickly and then we'll have the perfect and then um cesar will will play the recorded um session from this morning so let's see um and carlessa would have been here but she had a last minute scheduling conflict so fortunately this morning everybody pitched in and we got it pre-recorded so carlessa truxillo is currently a u.s import export compliance specialist for tsmc which is Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. 
She excels at keeping the company in compliance with the enormous number of import and export laws that affect daily operations. Among the areas under her purview are the oversight of global procedures, as well as harmonized tariff schedules, documentation, and coordination with freight forwarders. And that is not an all-inclusive list, by the way. Carlesa has managed compliance for business units in Canada, Singapore, and Dubai, and has facilitated internal training with international business units covering export controls, global economic sanctions, and trade regulations. Don't say any problem. So let's roll that interview. I'm ready for you, Cesar. It's okay. Okay, thank you. All right. So how long have you been working in international trade compliance? I've been working in international trade compliance for now 12 years. A long time. And what do you do for TSMC? I'm the U.S. Import and Export Compliance Specialist. I collaborate uh, with my team members on re relevant uh, laws and regulations. Okay, that sounds intense. <laughs> How did you get into this line of work? Actually, it was some years ago. I had a former boss who needed some assistance on the 7501 entry summaries, and I began um, doing some auditing. And I did such a good job, he recommended me for a position as an import-export compliance analyst, and I was selected for the position in the compliance department. Wow, good for you. So what types of products do you work with? Well, we work with uh, lithography equipment, um, parts and components for the semiconductor industries, and we do a lot of um, shipping when it comes to even imports and exports. Okay, great. And what country do you import from and why those particular countries? Well, we import from Singapore, China, Germany, uh, Japan, and we import these certain products because it, they're part of the semiconductor industry. So we have a lot of, um, let's say, parts and components um, to bring in uh, for construction so we can get the fab built. And then we also um, import a lot of equipment from the suppliers from Singapore. So it's been, it's been a great, a great experience. Fantastic. All right, let's see. Next question. Do the products come in by sea or by air or both? You know, actually, um, they all come by from air and sea. So right now we're dealing with a lot of air shipments. Um, and in, in regards to the air shipments, we have to kind of get in front of everything as far as making sure we have the correct documentation, we have to make sure that we have the commercial invoice, packing list, um, perhaps what meal certs or uh, certain uh, declarations. So we deal with a right. lot of um, imports. Okay. Yeah, I would imagine. Now, uh, in terms of paperwork, is there any difference uh, in the paperwork when a product comes in by sea or by air? Actually, no. Um, you basically need your commercial invoice, your packing list, and your bill of lading. So if it's coming by ocean, you're going to need your ocean bill of lading. And if it's coming by air, you're going to need your air bill of lading. Okay, but in terms of regulations and everything else, whatever you need to know, it needs to be on there, whether it's sea, by sea or by air, right? Yes, ma'am. And so there's also certain data elements that has to be on your commercial invoice in order it to get cleared through customs in a timely uh, manner. So for an example, you have to have the complete commodity description, you have to have the quantity, you have to have the unit price, unit of measure, the value, the value has to be um, in the currency um, based off of the purchase order. Um, you have to have the detailed information on your packing list in order for these items to clear the U.S. Customs in a timely manner, or there could be delays if there is missing information. Yeah, and we don't want delays. <laughs> no. Now, um, I'm sure there's a million and one regulations. Um, 
both from the US and wherever a product is coming from, how often do regulations tend to change? Oh, regulations change quite often and you have to be very um, up to date with all the information that's coming in. You're updating yourself, you're updating your staff, um, like everybody has to be on board. Yes, ma'am. On a regular basis. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay, cool. So you've been in this business for 12 years. What do you find most interesting about what you do? I find it most interesting of knowing the laws and the regulations for both imports and exports. Um, it's quite, um, it's, it's a lot of information that you have to know and you have to make sure that companies comply with customs and you have to make sure that they comply with also the other different um, government agencies. Bored, are you? Yes. Okay. Um, I think I can guess the answer to this question, but what do you find most challenging about what you do? For right now, the most challenging part is making sure that we have corrected shipping documents. So again, we have to make sure that the foreign shipper is providing all the data elements on the commercial invoice. Um, sometimes they may miss, for an example, the unit price, or they may not have the country of origin listed on their documentation, or they might not have the um, HTS even on the commercial invoice. So we have to go back to the suppliers and ask them to update the information in order for their product to get cleared through the customs. A lot of work. Uh, from a trade compliance perspective, what advice do you have for people who either want to get into importing or may already be importing, but they're fairly new to it all? Well, I would suggest of uh, doing your research on your suppliers because there are certain items that have anti-dumping duties and it can be more of a higher price to pay when it comes to importing that particular product. Um, you have to make sure that certain documents like your meal certificate or declarations are needed at the top of imports. So it's very, very important to um, research the suppliers that you work with or that you plan to attend to get the products from. Got it. Okay, thank you for that. And now let's let's switch focus to you. Tell us how we, Global Chamber members, can help you grow your business. Who would you like to meet in terms of referrals? I would like to meet someone in the commercial uh, services uh, program to where I can get the referrals from. Just in the U.S. or does that include people working around the world for the uh, commercial services? And for people working around the world, yes, ma'am. Okay, that's a lot of people we can refer to you. <laughs> We're on it. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us again today and sharing your knowledge with us. Appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Okay. So that was Carlessa. So you're all, you can unmute yourselves now. We're going to open it up to questions. Does anybody have any questions for any of our speakers, the three who are here with us. Hi. Hi, Anita. Hello. Thank you. Great conversation. Um, so I'm Donita. I manage a global program at the mill. And actually tomorrow we are having an imports workshop and um, but it's in person. So I particularly have a question for Baku because we have a lot of clients who want to bring stuff in from Africa. And I wanted to know, like, what are some of the challenges you have with imports coming in and which, where in Africa do you import from? Great question. Um, real quick, where, where are you based? I'm in Utah. Okay, Utah. Sorry. Um, so... I import from all across West Africa, specifically currently Senegal, Ghana, Nigeria, uh, a little bit of Cameroon, a little bit of Chad. Um, so, but primarily everything gets consolidated uh, in Nigeria and then exported from Nigeria to the U.S. Um, 
in terms of challenges, frankly, with with suppliers and importers, um, the biggest challenges I find are in really quality control. When I say quality control, I'm not talking about the, uh, it's not always the product itself. It's often the way it's packaged and what it's being packaged with. So a lot of importers, just to kind of put them into boxes, um, when you're importing from Africa, most importers from Africa have a container filled with maybe like 50 line items. So that's significantly different from what we do. We do one line item per container. Um, and yeah, so I find that that's some of the biggest challenges. We did a lot of research uh, around what products would be allowed. And we are very strategic about what products we do import. Uh, ourselves, a large portion of them are dried products. I think you're on mute. Thank you, thank you. And, um, do you basically, your products that you import, is it basically, you just do online or do you have a brick and mortar store um, set up? No, our primary channels are wholesale, white label and private label. So the core of our business is in wholesale distribution. Um, in terms of bulk, we do sell online in bulk, but uh, majority of our business is offline. So we work with manufacturers, distributors, those are primarily who we sell to. But with uh, white label and private label, we offer that because that's uh, sort of a new expansion in our business in manufacturing. So we have the manufacturing facilities in Africa, and we're able to create products for any customers here in the States or elsewhere around the world. Okay. And how, how difficult was it for you to sort uh, markets for your products here? Like what, what were um, some of the challenge, um, challenges and channels that you went through? Um, some of the challenges are around, you know, your portfolio of products. The other challenges are where the product is. So, uh, you know, from my experience working with buyers so far, a lot of uh, African importers contact them, but don't have the product physically. And, you know, that's a huge difference for us as well and where we saw an opportunity. So for us, we only call customers about products that we have, for the most part, uh, readily available for them to pick up. Now, we've grown to the point where we do have wholesale customers that are ordering directly from Africa, and we handle the entire logistics process for them as a service. Um, however, finding customers was a challenge. It was probably one of the bigger challenges in the beginning and had to spend, you know, at least a couple of years building trust by consistently delivering, you know, the product and the quality they want. Thank you. Thank Great you. questions, Vanita. Appreciate it. Does anyone else have a question? If not, I have a question for Lynn. Okay, I'm going to ask my question, Lynn. Um, what types of animals have you, because I was reading on your website that it, you also try and develop products for animals. What types of products are designed for animals in your portfolio? Well, originally we were working with topicals. Um, I'm, I'm involved in it. I'll mention the field I've gotten involved with stemming from that. But it was really fleas. Speak mites. a little bit closer oh, to your. Yes. Um... Yeah. Topical products that actually, when uh, you put them on, the animal need to actually go right on to the insect. It's not something they take internally. So it was for fleas, mites, ticks, um, products in, in that in that area. Um, and I'll just mention that uh, the expansion further in BioSafe was a little bit limited because we were investing. In some research, we have another company that's doing research in antimicrobial resistance on developing drugs. So, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm mentioning that because uh, a lot more would have been exported or put on the market from our um, from our array of products we brought back. But it required a lot of, as I mentioned, registrations and and putting a lot of marketing uh, pressure behind it. And we didn't do that as much because we were investing so much in, in our other company. So 
So, but that's what the, the products were uh, all non-toxic and, um, you know, that's basically what they were. Now we're working more with the internal. So, but those originally, and we found those really uh, it, developing products in Brazil, we found a lot of these uses really by accident. We weren't even targeting them. It's just that we we came across them in in really unusual ways and um, found that, that there was a, a lot of uses for some active ingredients that we had. So it's been an interesting journey, but hard to discuss, hard to describe here. But yeah, no, I would I would bet. But for the ones that are too problematic to go through the process here in the US, are you developing any of those like based in other countries? Like, do you have a branch where you can do no. that in another country? No, we started it in Brazil at one time, but as I mentioned, where where we've been um going into another country and doing the research on in a field that extended from our original where there's new patents and and other things that will be launched or announced pretty soon so no we we don't you know we we um we work we had them on the market you know for horses for um special products for grooming show horses or show animals great pet wow. products but never never really expanded as much as we could have because to make the claims we wanted to make also, each one had to go through this EPA process. So that's where we were. We were always stuck in that one, one spot. Uh, so we we would market it more as a cosmetic type product. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Yeah. Very cool. It's really, Thank you. yeah, just been a lot of variety of things. Yeah, sounds like it. Yeah, too many probably. <laughs> yeah. I know, I guess at some point in time, you have to whittle things down to focus and, and clearly you have. So that's that's a, that's a good thing. Um, anybody else have any questions? No? Okay. So I guess we will wrap up because we're just two minutes before the hour. Doug, any final comments? I really appreciate uh all the speakers what a what a group of outstanding experts and anita thank you for going above and beyond not only with this group but especially with carlessa you know tsmc as many of you know has made one of the most significant foreign direct investments in the united states of any company uh from from taiwan a huge semiconductor investment uh in the united states and carlessa has 101 things that she's doing she's been very busy and anita and carlessa have, <laughs> have been working to get that recording in place and so anita thank you for going above and beyond um what's what do you see as a next step uh because i know this is an ongoing program and you've already got some ideas of other ways to build on this yeah, so you and I will be talking about that and planning stuff over December. Uh, so we don't know what day it will be and what time it may change because we also want to include people in other parts of the world. So right now, I don't know if we have anybody from the UK on, but it's nine o'clock. Now it's almost 10. It is, it's 10 o'clock in, in London right now. So we, we're going to try some a couple of different time zones every now and then and different focuses. So the fun part is just keep an eye out for it. Um, check the calendar regularly and see when it fits into your schedule. Cause no matter what the topic is, it'll be fun and interesting. Yeah, and Shalom Baco is also on our uh, advisory board of Los Angeles, though he does a lot of work and is at originally based in Nigeria, and, but he's a global guy. And so this, this meeting is really a global chamber of Los Angeles centered uh, program. However, it is intended to be global. What's cool about the Los Angeles angle is the Port of LA is a member of global chamber and there's a lot of things coming in, including recently Shalom's uh, shipment in to, uh, to the port. So congratulations on that. Normally I think you come in through Atlanta, right? Or, or Houston. Uh, and this, yeah. this latest one came into to LA. Yeah, Savannah, New Jersey. And this was a this was a good one. So thank you. Okay. Well, continued success. Uh, and so uh, next time you drink uh, 
Jamaica tea. Is that how you pronounce mm -hmm. it? From from Mexico, yeah. you know, you've got hibiscus, maybe uh, from Shalom's uh, farms in uh, Nigeria. You never know. So thanks everybody for uh, zooming in today. If you have ideas or thoughts, either about speakers or how to best structure this in the future, let us know because as Anita mentioned, she and I will be uh, chatting about this over the next few weeks. And, and are you, are you coming to the December 7th holiday party in LA, Anita? Are you going to be there? I am. Of course yeah. I am. Do you so need Anita, me to pick you up from the airport? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Anita's my chauffeur, uh, has been my chauffeur. And so I really appreciate all that she does uh, on that and, you know, all the things that in the real world of business that she does. So thank you for that. If you are in Southern California on the 7th of December, we're having our holiday party in downtown LA there. And then around the world, we have a variety of different activities. I know a number of chapters have similar activities. And if you're not a member yet, let us know. And we're happy to help on that side of things too. If you are a member, you know, let us know. The two main questions we always ask, who do you want to meet and how else can we help? Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you everyone appreciate you okay thank you bye bye